My name is Alex Caserta. I recently retired from a 34-year career as a visual arts instructor in order to embark on a new adventure. As a photographer, my goal is to reveal historical information while shedding new light on the people and places that sustain our rich cultural heritage. This is an opportunity for us to discover the farms, food, and flavors of our beautiful state. This is a time for us to explore the diverse wonders in our own backyard. This is Harvesting Rhode Island. Good. <laughs> I'm here with Cole Walker today, and we're in Little Compton, Rhode Island, which is incredibly beautiful. The farmland down here is magnificent. Uh, Cole, you've been doing this for how long now? Well, we started this, uh, this operation in 1964. Uh, my father and I did. Uh, we just moved down here, and uh, I was starting college, and uh, it was, a, it was a means of uh, helping, helping pay for my education. And it was just, uh, and it was kind of a hobby for my father. And uh, I'd grown up on a dairy farm, so I had you know, a little knowledge of farming, uh, of, you know, the equipment, plowing and harrowing and all that. We started off a very, very small operation. And um, I, I ran the stand, my father grew the vegetables, and that, that was for like three, four years, and then um, I graduated from college. I went into the Peace Corps, and after the Peace Corps, I went to live in Australia for a while. So I was, I was gone for about three years, and my father, he, uh, you know, kept the stand going, and very, you know, and very low key, just, uh, you know, as a, as a hobby. He liked growing stuff. He was very, uh, very, very much into, uh, flowers and uh, specialty lettuces and things like that. When he got ill in 1970, I came back and uh, uh, I, it was a time for me to make a decision on my future. And uh, I'd graduated from URI with a degree in English and a minor in uh, philosophy and theater. And uh, I couldn't see myself working inside. So uh, I decided that perhaps um, there, the, the, perhaps that there could be a future in, uh, in a roadside stand. And gradually it paid off. Well, the People started coming and that, that was the beginning of it. I remember the stand being here when I was a kid and, and driving down this way. Now your grandfather and your father came over from Ireland? Scotland. Scotland? Yeah, and Scotland. Scotland, <laughs> uh, and, and, but, but yet you say your grandfather did not have a farm out there. No, no, he was not into farming. He, uh, he was into gardening, a very large yep. garden uh, and uh, a lot of fruit trees. But my father was, was, uh, was very much into farming. And, uh, and I know that your son, Ian, works the farm with you. Yes, he does, yeah. He's um, very interested in keeping this going, so yeah. he would be the he second generation. He's a, he's, a very hard, he's a very hard worker and uh, He's been taking over a lot of the growing for me, and uh, he's been doing a great job. Yeah. You know, uh, great no, job. Notice you have a lot of young people out here working the stand, and some of them have been with you for a number of years Yeah, now. some of them have. Some of them, uh, it's great when they come back year after year. Yeah. It, it makes, uh, makes life easier around here. And we do get new people. They have to be trained. Uh, a lot of them really know nothing about working or farming, and, uh, but that's okay. It's part of, it's part of the game. It's, uh, it's nice to see these young people take an interest in it, and um, and then you see them years later, and they say, you know, I really enjoyed working working on the farm. I learned a lot. And, uh, oh yeah, you know, it's a it's a nice thing to hear. It is. Ezra Rice, who is a worker. Uh, Ezra, what type of work do you do here now? You've been here for five years. I have, yes, many years. Uh, well, I'm more or less the tomato guy. I'm in charge of, uh, we have three greenhouses, yep. which produce uh, fruit very early in the year and very late in the year when it gets cold. Um, and then I also help out with squash, corn, and uh, whatever else needs to get done each morning. 
You do the picking in the fields? I do the picking, and then you actually have to grade the tomatoes too and clean them up a bit, so. Yeah. Now, how early do you plant in the greenhouses? Well, I believe they plant very early in the spring. I'm less of a part of that, um, yep. but I believe it's in uh, sometimes March, uh, April. So they come up pretty early. quick, and then you've got some in the ground? We do, yep, yep. So those are just starting to come up this week. It's been pretty warm, as uh, yep. I think everybody knows this summer. So yeah, we should have field tomatoes very soon, a lot of them. A few right now, but it takes uh, a couple of days for them to really come out in uh, full force. Now, do they hand pick the corn, or do they have a machine to do we that? We do. Something that's very special about walkers is we do hand pick our corn, which means we achieve a very high quality. Um, a lot of farmers today, it's cheaper to use a machine. Uh, but we really, it's quality over quantity here, and we want to make sure that each ear is guaranteed to be perfect. Um, and we really do, we have good corn. I yeah, can, oh, I can no, you're, you're famous for <laughs> your corn. Uh, it's been like that for years. How did you end up working here? Yeah, so Walker's is pretty famous in Little Compton. Uh, most people know about it. I actually just live down the uh, street. And uh, the first incident, my family actually has cows. Um, and one of them got out. There were actually some cornfields very close to our house. We had one cow that would get out, uh, got out many times that summer and would go and would just eat the, uh, the very tops of the, just the ears of the corn, none of the leaves <laughs> off of this one field. So that was my first experience with walkers. And I came here and I like to think I've paid off some of that uh, so debt that as, our As the police were taking eaten. you away, That's exactly you made right, arrangements yep. for a yeah. job <laughs> as a payoff. Got like, out of jail, <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> Um, do you, enjoy, you must enjoy working here. <laughs> I, what a pleasure. Yeah, it's beautiful. The people are great. Um, Cole and Ian are fantastic. Uh, both of them great bosses. You can't beat a family business to work for. You really can't. And are you in college when you're not working I am. Farm? Yep. So I go to Bowdoin College in Maine right now. Oh, yeah. um, what are you studying? We'll see. Only a freshman. Just finished my first year, but maybe uh, political science. Yeah. Uh-huh. In time for the next... Uh roll around. Maybe, <laughs> yeah, if there still is one. <laughs> I notice there's a lot of young people and they, everyone seems to really get along well they over do, here. Yeah. Well, I think the thing about walkers is everybody really takes pride in their own work. And um, we don't have to have uh, Ian and Cole really looking over us too constantly because each person, whatever crop or chore they have, really takes it seriously and um, likes to do a good job. So, How do you feel about people going into farming, young people? I think it's a great career. Uh, America needs more farmers, especially in, uh, you know, New England, where uh, people are really, there's a craving for local produce today. Mm -hmm. I think it's environmentally um, much, you know, much better for the earth. And I think uh, oftentimes we produce a superior product. It doesn't have to get shipped very far. Most of our things are picked the day they're bought. Um, and we're not tampering at all with them. So Okay, so when you get in the Senate, then you're going to push for more assistance in farming. Definitely. I okay. would hope we don't have to push too hard that uh, the people know what's best and that they know that uh, a local product is uh, very much superior, especially in the summer. So. Okay, thanks a lot, Ezra. Definitely. Thank you very <laughs> Thank much. You. Have a wonderful day. You too. And uh, I notice you still have a flower uh, section here where you grow uh, fresh flowers that you sell on Yeah, the we stand. grow dahlias, yes. A lot of dahlias. Yep. And I noticed that there were some different types of berries out there. Yeah, we have uh, raspberries and a few strawberries. Uh-huh. And did I see blackberries? Yes, I was there's even one row of blackberries out there. You'll have corn right through what month? This? Oh, through September anyway. And, I, in, I, in, and, and some years it goes into October. But uh, Is there a particular type of corn that you plant? Uh, we grow a lot of different varieties, uh, uh, mostly butter and sugar types, um, some white corn. Uh, there are a lot of different varieties now that they've come out with, which uh, are, are big improvements over what we had yeah. 20, 30 years ago. You know, they're sweeter, they're more tender, they're better looking, uh, they have a lot of uh, attributes. Do you have any message for young people uh, who would like to get into farming? Do you think it's something that is doable today? Yes, I think it's doable if you're willing to work very hard. If, if money is your goal, it's the wrong business. If growing gives you satisfaction, 
if, uh, if you want to do a real quality job and produce quality products for the public, it, it can be done. You know, it, it takes honesty, it takes, um, it takes perseverance, and, uh, and it, takes, it takes the right attitude, I think. Yeah. If you're, it takes patience and... Um, it's a certain lifestyle that... You... It, it does, and it, it, uh, it takes humility, because there's nothing like a... You can be humbled by, by uh, Mother Nature in a, in a second. Um, whether it's the birds attacking the corn, or a hurricane that knocks it down, there are so many things that can happen to your crops. They're outside, unprotected. You just have to roll with the punches and uh, get an attitude of, well, hey, it happened, it happened, you can't do anything about it. And move on and uh, don't let it get you too down because uh, it's not worth it. I'm at Green Animals today in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. I'm here with the head horticulturist, Dan Christina. Dan, this place is just unbelievable. It is what I would call a living museum. And I'm wondering just how many people know about it in Rhode Island, because if they don't know about it, they're certainly missing something. Well, I feel like we're definitely a undervisited hidden gem, uh, definitely on Aquidneck Island for sure. Um, as part of the Preservation Society of Newport County, we're, one, we're probably the smallest, most outlier property that we have, and whereas the larger mansions get a big focus, here we're more of a garden estate, and we're actually one of the last examples of a gentleman farm turned self-sufficient garden estate, where we have a wide range of offerings here. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the history of the uh, yeah. property? Yeah, so in uh, 1877, Thomas Brayton purchased this property, and the reason he purchased this was that its location to the rail line, which you can see in yeah. the distance beyond us, um, allowed him to have a, a station put in, or stop put in for him, so he could ride the train to work in Fall River in the morning and come back down on the train uh, in the afternoons. He was the CEO treasurer of Union Cotton Manufacturing, which runs the Durfee Mills in Fall River. He was pretty happy and pretty successful. He had uh, four children, three daughters and a son. Alice ended up being the main preserver of this property. Thomas had had a really interesting way that he decided to let this property evolve. He had found a caretaker at the mills, um, a man who was doing a good job cleaning up the shrubs and the debris around the factories and decided, why don't you come to my property and take care of it? And what he hadn't realized was that this man had descended from great topiary garden artists and uh, gardeners in general from the Azores. Uh, Jose Carrero started working on the property around that time and was told basically as long as we had enough food and produce and berries for the season, you could do whatever else you wanted to on the <laughs> property, which is extraordinary really, uh, that kind of liberty. So he was given the chance to just do whatever he wanted and he decided he wanted to create animal shapes and topiaries. Um, we have more than 80 pieces of shaped characters on the property. Uh, we have arches and borders and a whole run. He was given liberty and as they realized his skill, um, they gave him more and more of the property. And he was caretaker um, up until, I want to say 1950s uh, when he passed away and his son-in-law who um, had come in 1938 to help clear up after the hurricane and started taken on to this kind of work, um, took over from then, and he managed, he worked here until Alice Brayton, the daughter, passed away and donated the property to the Preservation Society. And he didn't stop working then, he kept, he kept uh -huh. working after that. Everybody who's here has been here for a while and has real love and knowledge for the property, and that's a huge help here. Yeah, one of the, one of the interesting things is that, aside, a, in a different style from English gardening and French, is that we have a lot more um, shaped, whimsy, kind of characters that are here, um, whereas the English tends to be much more geometric shapes repeated over form. Um, these, we, you know, we have a, a growly bear, we have a swan that's nesting, you know, we have our camel and our giraffe. Um, real fun, exciting things from around the world um, that are shaped and, you know, some of those pieces are over a hundred years old. 
That's it's still incredible. Been great. Yep. And there are people working out here all the time. Seems like you have a staff of volunteers also that come in here to help? Yep, we have a great uh, core of volunteers, about eight that have been coming regularly uh, for the past many, many years. Yep. Um, and we get a new one or two every year. Um, and in addition to that, we just have um, three part-time staff members and three full-timers, and, and that's it. You know, we're seven acres. We've got annual beds. We've got perennial borders. We have berry beds with all sorts of different types of fruit, common raspberries and things like foxberry that you wouldn't really see anywhere. We have figs that bear fruit for us uh, every year. Um, we have a cutting garden. We have um, all sorts of different types of topiary shapes. Some are made from boxwood, some are made from yew, some are made from privet. Um, we have our rose beds. We have a gigantic uh, vegetable garden, which we've continually increased the size of um, over the past several years and espalier gardens. I mean, we really have quite a bit here. Quite a it's, bit. It's in, amazing. In range. Even grapevines. Yep, we have plenty of grapevines. <laughs> yeah. They they loved uh, jellies, jams, and and wine, and so they made everything yep. from here on site. They had to buy in very little, um, and this this property also supplied their Fall River estate and the staff for that. So Dan, what are we coming up to over here? This tall creature. So here in the formal garden, we have our uh, giraffe, which, is, which was one of the older pieces, but has undergone uh, quite a serious renovation. Um, a few years back, and twice actually in its lifetime, we've had a couple of issues with the, uh, the neck and the head due to ice, where it has uh -huh. snapped off. Uh, the head was regrown and snapped off again uh, in an ice storm about eight, nine years ago. And it, just this year and last year, we've really been able to get the head to, to fill out and to form back up. Um, this giraffe is actually four separate plants. If you look at the base, you can see that each leg okay. is a cluster of stems, um, and they all intermingle and they get tied off, they get snipped, they get wired on uh, to a framework, which is what we decided to do for this piece um, to prevent that kind of ice breakage again. And uh, he's, you know, filling out and going to be pretty happy. We're letting the neck grow as long as we can. Part of the problem is that if we let it go too long, the likelihood of it snapping again is is pretty high. How old is this piece? Uh, so the draft was originally installed in the early 1900s, somewhere between 1906 uh, and 1912. And then you have, is that an elephant? Um... Yep, we have an elephant which is having a little bit of stomach problems. Um, <laughs> over the winters we lose some parts of the pieces uh, just due to old age. You know, they're all in that same hundred plus year old range. And we're always adding new plants into the core oh, of okay. the standard so that at the time we need them, we can just train the new pieces up through the frame and allow them to fill out where we need them to. Uh, there must be a tremendous amount of trimming and you have one person who does that? Uh, there's, uh, we have one person, Eugene Platt. He does the majority of the topiary shapes and animals and characters. Uh, Andrew Pont does the majority of the shapes, arches, um, obelisks, any of the boxwood um, domes, um, and then I do the majority of all the boxwood parterres. So it's oh. a three-man job just to keep on top of that stuff, um, okay. and in addition to the garden space as well.
Patricia Bailey, who is the Community Outreach Horticulturist here at Green Animals. And you are in charge of... The vegetable garden. Vegetable garden. Yes. Let's talk about the community outreach a little bit. Um, so you have vegetables growing here, mm -hmm. but you don't sell the vegetables. We don't. No. We, um, we actually started the vegetable garden several years ago where we really wanted to expand and have um, a community outreach component. And mm -hmm. so we decided to really partner with some other organizations here on Aquidneck Island. And we've um, merged with uh, Lucy's Hearth, which is a women and children shelter. We also have done work with the Martin Luther King Community Center, mm -hmm. um, John Clark Nursing Home. Um, and we really feel like it's an integral part of the vegetable garden to be able to um, provide and keep the community together and the connectedness that food provides for us. And so it's a natural place to be able to give the vegetables away. Patricia, there must be some sort of special vegetable that you can tell me about that you have growing here. I, I heard something about Thomas Jefferson uh, growing something that you're growing. The Costa Luda Genovese. Is from? A, from Italy. From Italy. From Italy. <laughs> we um, are growing that in honor of Thomas Jefferson. He was instrumental in introducing the tomato to the American culture. It was believed uh, that it was, it was actually referred to as the love apple and it was believed that it was poisonous. And so when he got wind of the fact that people in Europe were, were enjoying it and eating it, mm -hmm. he decided, well, let's, let's bring it to uh, the United States. And it was the Costa Luda Genovese was the first that he introduced to a farmer's market down in, in Washington. So, oh, so he was one of the original gentleman farmers then. He was, he was. And if you do look back at the history of our founding fathers, it's really, you know, um, a, a fabric of who we are as Americans. The yeah. um, uh, John the, Adams had a farm. They all had yeah. farms. Yeah. And it's really, I mean, indicative of the American culture. Yeah. You know, you look into our vegetable garden and it is just wrought with immigrants, you know? You think yeah. about it, look at all the vegetables that we have. Um, we really want to be able to show the public the different varieties that are out there and how it really connects us. You also have a couple of scarecrows in the garden and, and they have a history also. They do have a history. Uh, George um, Mendonca, who was the gardener here, had discovered a foam pole that had fallen onto the, onto the property and, in the, and that was around the 1940s. He took the foam pole and carved it into four pieces and carved these heads that we still have today. And then the uh, bodies are simply, you know, two by fours and chicken wire, but <laughs> they're instrumental in keeping the crows and the bunnies and the deer um, away from, away from our, our garden. Patricia, we're uh, standing in the uh, middle of the tomato garden here, and you have quite a few, and I'm amazed to see how tall they are. How do you usually take care of these? Well, we start our tomatoes in the greenhouse in early March, and we really uh, try to get them to get as robust as they can, so we're, we fertilize with a natural organic fertilizer, and then we harden them off in the cold frames, and then we plant them out here, and we have been using these stacking ladders. This is our third year yeah, using the stacking ladders. They're wonderful, and they come in three-foot increments, and they're um, amazing for tomatoes. It really limits how much tying you have to do yep. for tomatoes. So we have 12 different varieties of tomatoes this year, and uh, all heirlooms. We've put down salt marsh hay to help combat the tomato blight, which often happens later in the season, which is a soil-borne disease. Oh. And it generally happens when you get a heavy rain and it splashes up onto the leaves. Mm -hmm. So when you put down the salt marsh hay, that really does help combat that problem. And here we have the hops growing right behind us on the trellis system. We do. Can you explain a little bit about how this works? And hops are basically the flower of the plant okay. and it's used in beer making and it's usually utilized at the end of the beer making process as an additional flavor. And what we're doing is we're growing um, six different varieties of hops here and this is our second year and we have them planted in the ground. Each spring new shoots come out and what we're doing is we're cutting back a majority of the shoots because we really want to have as concentrated as a hop as we can. So we're keeping four to five shoots is all that we're growing. And it's a constant because it yeah. really wants to grow. Hops really want to grow. This is just this season's growth 
and if you look all the way up oh, at the it's top, it's quite high. It's quite high, um, and you can see which varieties have taken off, and hot buds are beginning to form. Oh, yeah, right here. Exactly, they're beginning to form here, and they will fill out right around September, and when it comes time for us to harvest these, we'll just take the line off of this cleat yep. here, and we'll um, unravel that and lay it down Lower onto the, the grass so that we can actually harvest. We just dry it out, you air dry it, and then you can use it in, in, in beer making. And last year we actually uh, made a really lovely apricot wheat, and we also did a Green Animals Pale Ale, and um, who knows what we're gonna have this year. So <laughs> you'll have to come back. very interesting garden um, because Jose Carrera was given such liberty he had a lot of Portuguese influence in the first designs of the garden yes. and then when the later caretakers um, came in they added their own specific flavors and it's funny to see how everything has kind of meshed together and, and you know my own touches now are, are really meshed very well in it I think the property as a whole looks like one continuous garden of Pure joy, really. Well, walking through here, it's almost what you would see in a fairy tale, mm -hmm. <laughs> like a secret garden of Absolutely. some sort. From week to week, the property's changing. I mean, the, the people who come, you know, May 12th or, or May 17th are seeing it different than the people who come mid-June. And by the time we get to August, the gardens have evolved even then. You know? and, and I love it. I mean, I couldn't imagine being or doing any other kind of work than what I'm doing now. The ability to start a seed in January, to, see, to plant it in May, and then to harvest or to see it come to fruition throughout the year is just really you know, a unique gift. Okay, thank you. Thank you.